uh, welcome to another episode of Unfiltered. Um, in this slow week, uh, we have a few things uh, to, to review and discuss and show, show you. Um, but before we start the show, uh, today, uh, Senate Majority Leader, ex-Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid passed away. Uh, and Steve, you had um, another announcement to make. Yeah, well, and I think I, I just found out less than an hour ago that um, John Madden, uh, the great football coach of the Oakland Raiders, uh, passed away. I think he was 85. I think Senator Reid was 82. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, both of these guys in their 80s. Uh, made their mark on the world. John Madden uh, went on to become an announcer, a football announcer for like three or three decades or more. And, uh, and then also came up with the concept of the Madden football game, which even young kids who never saw him coach one day uh, have played that game and, and, and been introduced to football through playing a game. And so this guy's career has covered a lot. He, Darius, he was my favorite announcer ever because he was kind of like, a regular guy announcing a football, you know, and so, uh, so it just, he was just really a good guy. And I, I uh, watched a little video on his career and just almost everybody that ever played for him or ever worked with him had great things to say about him. Rest in peace, John Madden and uh, Harry Reid. Um, so now let's dive into uh, the first part of our show. And by the way, it's the second part that are kind of wrong kind of a round robin, round robin is going to be about all the stuff that's happening with taxes and inflation. And we have some great stats to share with you on inflation. And then finally, we're going to talk about some of the laws that are going to, that are going to roll out here uh, January 1st in California. Okay, so let's uh, dive in. Donato Mireles, a teacher at uh, Sanger Unified, correct? That's correct. Uh, that all that has taken steps to teach kids some really extraordinary skills that is going to come very handy as they grow up and enter society and uh, you know become consumers and taxpayers uh, and, and great citizens of our community. So, Donato, t tell us uh, what you're working on and what what you what some of your special skill I mean special teaching programs are. <laughs> So again, um, thanks for having me on the show and um, happy to be here. But yes, I do teach uh, math out at uh, Sanger Unified. I'm at Sanger High School, the Bethel campus. We have two campuses now, but I am at the at the Bethel campus. And it's it's very difficult for a lot of our students these days. You know, one, they're trying to find themselves in a high school environment. And then two, it's like, you know, what, what do I want to do when I when I grow up? And, you know, I knew at a young age I wanted to teach math. You know, for, for some people, you know, they, they might call me, you know, a little bit weirder, but I, I, I really enjoyed math. That was one of the, the subjects that really kept my interest in school. Um, unfortunately, it's not like that for a lot of our students. So me as a math teacher, when I'm talking in front of them saying, OK, guys, we're going to graph a fourth degree polynomial and find its roots. They're looking at me like, what language are you speaking? Because this does not resonate with me. So unfortunately, um, I don't think not only in our district, but, you know, across the nation, we we're losing a lot of students and not you know, giving them skills that they're going to need in life. What, so, sk you, what, skills are you, what skills are you giving these students? So I teach high school financial math right now. So the, the students that I have, they come into my classroom, they learn the things in life that they're going to use immediately once they leave high school and become an adult. We teach them how to open up a, a checking account, how to balance their checking account. We teach them about taxes. We teach them about, you know, their dependents, you know, how what's the difference between filing your state taxes by, between um, filing your, your federal taxes. Uh, we tell them, you know, how many of you are going to want to buy a car in your future? And, you know, hands go up. We say, okay, well, do you guys know what it takes to buy a car? Do you guys know about interest rates, you know, down payments? So we start talking about insurance. We start talking about, you know, registration fees. And all of a sudden, you know, these students are sitting in a math classroom with their heads down, start to pick up their head. And, you know, well, what if I want to buy a Mustang, you know, or what if I want to buy a Camaro? I go, you guys can buy anything you want. And it just comes down to, you know, something called your, your debt to income ratio. So we start talking, having these conversations, the student get really excited about. And we actually, in um, San Unified, thankfully, we are a one-to-one -one district as far as technology. So every student has access to, to an iPad. So we'll tell them, you know what, open up your iPad. We're going to do a quick lab here in this class. And they go on car gurus and they will search for a used car. 
and they have to look at how much it costs. We figure out some taxes, we break down payments. And um, we just finished up our first semester there at Sanger High, but going into second semester, we start talking about um, home purchasing and, you know, the pros of renting versus owning. And we have students go on Zillow.com and they'll look for a million dollar house in Fresno. We let them role play like, you know, you have this much income, so you have to buy this house versus, you know, you make only this much. So these are your options. And they get really excited about it because for you know, many students, when you walk into a math classroom, again, you start talking polynomials and degrees of functions. It just, they don't see themselves using that in the real world. And, you know, fortunately for me, I was able to, I'm, I'm, I'm a math major from Fresno State and that stuff held my interest, but doesn't hold the interest of a lot of our students. So the fact that we're able to give them things that they're going to need and they get excited about, um, they walk out with a little bit of a, you know, leg up on life and they're not so, you know, afraid of entering into the world on their own because they now they'll be prepared to make these financial decisions that they probably wouldn't have been able to without a course like this. And as, you know, students graduate from, from our school and they take financial math, they ask themselves, you know, why, why won't you guys offer this, you know, earlier, you know, how come more students can't take financial math? And, you know, it's something we really want to, you know, work on. And I know there's other um, districts out there that are offering similar courses. Um, I'm currently in a math, uh, master's of math ed program at FPU. And a lot of the colleagues that I have in that program have also said, you know, we have a financial type of class too. We're teaching students a lot of the same thing. So um, in the near future, I would, you know, really, you know, like to see, you know, this type of course offered to, to many students, not just, you know, outgoing seniors, but, you know, many students. And I think we'll, we'll actually be able to, um, one, help them out in life, but capture a lot of those students that we, we kind of lose because, you know, they don't, they don't have an interest in school. And I think this is one way to, you know, keep them in the classroom, you know, keep them, keep them with their heads up and just have a positive outlook on their future. Donato, I think that's fantastic. I just got to tell you, hearing that is a big blessing. I remember uh, way back when I was in high school, uh, we had a little, um, like a, a quarter where uh, back then we went to school in quarters. And I know that some schools don't do that now, but um, we did a quarter where we followed the stock market and we were all given a thousand dollars, you know, of hypothetical money and we would pick stocks and, and just see how it worked. And I still remember to this day, the stock that I picked, it was uh, $3 and within that quarter, it went up to $3 and 50 cents. And I wish I would have bought it in the real world. Right. But, uh, no, I totally agree with you 100%. These skills are so much needed um, in our in our community uh, today. People need to understand how to buy a car, you know, the cost of all the other stuff that goes along with that. And that's, a like you said, it's a prelude to buying a house. And so, um, you know, I wish I would have known a lot more of that stuff earlier as well. And I think uh, you could probably teach that uh, same class to a, a bunch of elected officials if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, uh, you had a question. Appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. Yes, uh, yeah, no, I, I just, for our guest, I really wanted to thank you, Mr. Morales, for what you're teaching. So you made a good point about kids getting excited. And I imagine that these skills they get, they're also going to be able to use them at home and help their parents. Um, and then, you know, when they're going to go to college, hopefully they'll do that or they'll be faced with student loans to be able to know how to negotiate better terms up front and how to make the best decision possible. So they're not basically, you know, trading the opportunity for today by just, you know, being in the bondage of having to owe interest upon interest. Here's the other really neat thing. So you talked about like basic skills, learning about interest rates and budgeting and how to buy a car versus and how to really make your money go further. That's a very, very big deal because, you know, we're going to talk about inflation later today, but, one of the issues in inflation, I mean, obviously there are bigger factors out there, but how we spend our money makes a difference. How we can make our dollars stretch longer makes a difference. Buying a cell phone, if you're not careful, you'll spend way more in one place versus another and it's the same product. So this is very cool. You know, this is the kind of stuff kids, when they become adults, will use. I have, you know, bought a car a few times or negotiated, you know, a loan before, but only once have I had to use the Pythagorean theorem to, you know, figure out how long the diagonal measurement of a room was. And that was, it happened to be a, a month ago. I was trying to make a point on something and I, I, I knew how to do it. I've never used it other, other than that. So it, this good, is great. Good. good. You, okay. You know, I wanted to jump in and say, uh, and Donato, I wanted to ask you a question about that because I actually, I was one of those odd students and I really enjoyed math. 
and I enjoyed trigonometry and algebra and all of the, I, I really, and I did okay in it. Um, and, but Mike is right. You don't use it really on a daily basis unless you're in that industry. But in Fresno County, we need a lot of workers who have a math background and they need to know um, the details of, of math and how to operate math. And uh, engineers are right. in high demand in our society. They're high demand in Fresno County. And we're trying to build a lot of things. If you're going to build something, you need an engineer. If you have an engineer, that engineer is going to have to have some math background. Math background. So, okay. you know, and so how often, Donato, my question is, when you have a classroom full of students, how, how many of them would you say really enjoy math and you see the light go on? I have um, year to year. I, I, it, the number of students I have ranges from about 100 to about 130, 140 students. And I'd say out of those 140 students on average, maybe five want to pursue um, you know, a degree in, in pure mathematics, whether they take that towards engineering, whether they take that towards, you know, physical sciences, um, that's still up in the air, but they do know they want to pursue some type of pure mathematics background. And, um, you know, the good thing I was talking about technology earlier too, is that they are one-to-one. -one. So another thing I tell them, I go, look guys, even when NASA scientists, you know, get ready to, um, and engineers get ready to launch a rocket into space, I go, they're using a computer now. You know, so where there's always going to be a need for pure mathematicians, pure, phys pure physicists, you know, pure engineers. But at the end of the day, when we come down to actually getting those things done, you know, computers are doing the work for us. But, yeah, we still need people to program. So I let them know that, you know, you might not need to know, you know, the Pythagorean theorem. You might not need to know the, the double angle formula, you know, but it's good to have that in your background because one day you might have to program a computer to do those calculations to send the next, you know, you know, missile up into space. So we tell them that math is still needed. However, the things that they'll need immediately, immediately in life, you know, they're going to be much easier as far as the skill set that they're going to need. They won't need to know Pythagorean theorem, so to speak, but they will need to know, hey, I need to know how to, you know, balance my checkbook. I need to know how to put a budget together. And we're starting to use those things for them. So on their iPads, they make, you know, a mock budget and we teach them how to use Google Sheets, how to use Microsoft Excel to basically plug in their expenses and let the calculations of, you know, Word and, and Google, like, do the calculations for them. So every time they pay a bill, it's like, okay, my balance is now updated. And then they love it. They say, I'm going to go home. And like you just mentioned, I'm going to teach this to my parents, or I'm going to use this on my Etsy business that I have. And it's just like, I love hearing that because one, they're excited they're actually putting it to use, whether it be their home or their actual little business. Cause some of them actually, believe it or not, they have businesses, but um, they sell t-shirts or they, they clean shoes on the side. And they're like, well, I need to keep track of my inventory. I'm like, let's let Google sheets do that for you. So you don't have any errors, but it's, it's neat to finally start to capture more of our students that might not have been on a four-year path to a university. And um, I, I love what I do, so. Yeah, you know, when I, when I graduated, my guess would have been out of the 120 students or 140, like you see per year, I think it would have been more like 20 to 25 um, students who would have, you know, been good at math and, and understood the value of math and then wanted to pursue something that included math. Maybe it wasn't Maybe they were not going to be a professor of math or a teacher of math, but but they still knew that math was a strong background they had to have. So it seems to me like that interest level in math has diminished then over the years. And that's very worrisome to me. You know, when I look at our society and I get it, a computer can do a lot of the calculations for you. But I still think um, it's it's damaging to us overall that people have lost interest or don't understand the, the need for math in their, in their daily lives. So tell me about the other side of the ledger. How many students do you feel they get to your class and they'd really struggle if you asked them, you know, how, how to divide seven by two? And, you know, and so something really basic. How, what, do you, how do you, what do you see as far as the problem? So I think there's there's a huge problem, you know, that's, you know, again, across the country with students and, and math in general, you know, students, they they have a hard time, you know, coming in with, you know, their basic foundational skills, you know, multiplication, um, um, adding, subtracting, positive, negative numbers. So the fact that, you know, at, 
I'm, I'm still referring back to my class. The fact that we get him in at seniors, like, look, it's not too late to, so to speak, start over. You know, you're having trouble adding and subtracting. Okay, here's a calculator. We're going to take that challenge away. If, if the challenge is you can't add and subtract correctly, here's the calculator. Do your calculations correct? You can follow through with the lab. You can follow through with the assignment. We're going to take that away. So we're going to use technology to our benefit. And we'll still go back and try to supplement and get those kids with intervention times to try to get them to, you know, build that skill set again. But I think it's one, we're capturing them. We're building the confidence. And once the confidence is built again, then they can go back and reestablish that skill set that they're, that they're lacking because um, we just saw from COVID having to teach online for, for a year that a lot of our students missed out on a lot of instruction and um, it's, it is hurting them. It, it is hurting them, but um, there, there will never be a substitute for needing to know pure math. But again, for, for the students that, you know, that I have that they're already seniors they're they're kind of, this is just the last class they need just to graduate. I feel it's a real good way to get them confident again about that, that subject of math and how they're going to use it, you know, get them excited and just um, prepare them for life. So. Any other questions, Steve? <clears throat> no, you know, I think, uh, you know, my other job is I've, I've had a carpet cleaning business. It's a very blue collar business. You wouldn't, nobody would ever think, you know, that you need a math background to have a carpet cleaning company. But in all reality, you know, you get a certain detergent, you read the label, it says mix it six to one with um, hot water, uh, you know, or add two ounces to a cup of a solution. I still think that we need to know math and, yeah. and it's not all about engineers and um, astronauts, you know, Correct. it's all of us. So. I really applaud you, Donato, for trying your best and being successful in getting kids interested, getting students, I shouldn't call them kids, getting young adults interested in math. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Good. Okay. Let's move on to the next uh, segment, which is going to be, um, you, guys, you guys want to talk about redistricting first or inflation? Steve. Well, in the county, redistricting is a done deal. We beat it to death. Okay. It is what it is. The, the bigger interest has moved on to the statewide offices and the congressional offices. And we've seen those maps are now um, pretty much solidified. And they might be challenged in court, I understand. But um, California has its maps now. It's going to create some interesting um, changes in local politics. And the federal maps have also been um, finalized. So we're going to see a lot of uh, elected officials shifting around, running for different areas, trying to represent a different group of people than they have in the past. So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a, a high version of musical chairs, so to speak. And so uh, I just think it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, one of the articles uh, published by David Taub, GB Wire, talks about fellow Dems uh, targeting Hurtado's district for state Senate re-election bid. Uh, it could, that could be where Anna Caballero, Senator Caballero, may be running against Senator Hurtado. Is that true? Yeah, I read that article. Um, yeah. And by the way, I just want to throw a shout out to David Taub. I think he's done an excellent job following all of these redistricting stories. And he's broke it down uh, so the readers of GD Wire, you know, can really get an understanding of the impact of redistricting. So let's okay. just take this race that you talked about right here, uh, Darius. This pits two Democratic state senators against each other. These two women um, have both been on the same side of 99% of the policies, and they work together actually on several of them um, as a team. And so, but what redistricting has done is force them to run against each other. And so I don't know how that will work its way out, uh, but these are the type of things that are gonna happen. Okay, yeah. And a uh, similar thing could happen with uh, uh, Jim Costa. Well, yeah. we know, and, and maybe Mike wants to jump in um, um, on the Democrat side of the aisle. You know, Jim Costa has been a longtime Valley elected and uh, he's always represented um, a part of the city of Fresno. And then the rest of his district has moved around over the years. Normally, 
He served from Fresno north up to Madera and Merced. Uh, he just came out a week ago and declared that he's going to represent the south part of Fresno and south of the city of Fre uh, south of the city of Fresno, uh, the South Valley. So it's interesting. Even a U.S. congressman is changing uh, based on the redistricting lines. Quickly, Mike, because then we're going to uh, jump into the new laws that are uh, coming on January first. Mike, you're on mute. It's, it's really easy, especially when you think it's your time to want to challenge an incumbent like Jim Costa. But as we saw, um, I wouldn't advise that. Uh, Jim is always out in this community, even though he's a member of Congress. He's well liked. And if you want someone who can actually represent your interests and get stuff done, having someone with connections and experience makes a big difference. So I don't think anyone's going to be able to beat Jim. That's just how I feel on that. I mean, they're welcome to try, but we've seen who, how that goes. Mike, who would be... Who would be uh, the Democrats that might jump in that race? I don't know. I mean, look, the problem is if you do that, you're going to force Democrats that the Democratic Party to spend money defending Jim instead of helping other Democrats run for office when Democrats, it's not looking too good in the midterms right now. So you're really going to make the party mad by trying to by deterring, basically funneling money away from other races. But, you know, sometimes that happens with politics. Yeah, I don't know I who would be crazy enough to do it, but the ambition has no logic sometimes. You know, this Darius, to me, the one that's a kind of a huge question mark is this special election to replace uh, Congressman Nunes. And um, so because Congressman Nunes has, has already left office, I think he's leaving it on the first or I don't know what the official date is, but he's basically already gone. There's going to be a special election that is good for a district that only is going to exist one more year until next January. And then it shifts into the new district. So one of my colleagues, one of my colleagues, uh, Nathan Magzig, has announced to run for that special election. I know that State Senator Borges has talked about it. Uh, David Taub has wrote extensively on this special election uh, to replace Devin Nunes. Um, but to me, I've got big question marks like you. So if you win, um, you have to quit your current job because you now have a new job and then it only lasts for a year. And then you have to then the district dramatically changes and becomes a very Democrat um, voter majority seat. And so, you know, the thing is fascinating to watch people with their strategies. Mike. I think yeah, that's a good point. And Valadeo's district is a good example of how you can have a district that's blue, that's represented by an R because that person does their job and represents their district. So, I mean, if you have maybe a person that is that is a Republican, but says, you know, I'm not going to be hardcore party line. I'm going to, you know, these are my values I'm running on this, but I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and sticks to it, sticks to the basics. That may be a possibility. It's an uphill battle, but um, it's very possible. Yeah. I've you know, I, I don't, before we rush into our next item, I wanted to say one thing to me personally that I think is a very goofy is that the um, congressional seat that includes the city of Clovis goes all the way down into Kern County, Bakersfield, and it look and it's it's kind of built as a Republican seat, so to speak. Um, and it looks like Kevin McCarthy will run for that seat. He's the uh, minority leader at the time in, in the House of Representatives. Um, he's been a strong, you know, a force to be reckoned with. But to me, it's really goofy that he's going to be representing Clovis all the way from Bakersfield. So, so some of the lines, the way they're drawn, still to me are very sketchy. Uh, and people gave Fresno County a bad time. Uh, but in reality, you know, some of these federal seats are just crazy. You know, Steve, we went through all this trouble of opening it up to public and not having the politicians draw the lines. And then look what happened. It, all the interest groups still had their say and you get these funky districts. I mean, do the people of Clovis look, there's Democrats, Republicans. There's a lot of good folks in Clovis of all different persuasions. Are they going to have access to a member of Congress going to listen to them that understands their neighborhoods? So we'll see what happens. Yeah, great point. Totally. Okay. Um, all right, if, you, if your guys are okay, let's move on. We know we have inflation coming. 
uh, but we also have a new laws coming uh, January 1st. Uh, there's a couple of articles out uh, today, at least one article out today on GB Wire about, it's an, actually an aggregation from the Wall Street Journal on uh, food prices going up between two and 20% uh, next year. So uh, check out that, the article uh, on GB Wire. And then uh, we have a lot of new laws uh, rolling in uh, January 1st. You guys want to dig into that real quick? Yeah, sure. The, the, the bacon, should we bacon start with one. the bacon law and then the street racing law? I think that's a Mike Carbasi special. Were you a co sponsor uh -huh. on that, Mike? <laughs> no, I just prodded them. Finally got them to do something. Okay. <laughs> there you but, go. Yeah. Okay, let's start with, with the bacon uh, law. Uh, which uh, was approved, uh, Prop 12, approved by 63% of voters, requires that eggs sold in state come from cage-free hens and uh, pork sold comes from pigs that are aren't raised in cramped cages. Sounds good. Pork producers are saying that this could raise the cost of bacon by 60%. Um, and yeah, some, some pork producers such as Hormel say they're okay with it. Um, uh, Hormel's Applegate brand already complies with Proposition 12. I don't eat bacon, so I wanna ask you guys what your thoughts are. Steve? Yeah, I uh, love bacon. Okay. I don't, I don't, I, you know, but in all reality, I don't buy it a lot. When I go out to a breakfast with some friends, I'll, I'll usually get bacon. Uh, but I do understand, and I I know why it's popular. It's very tasty. It's already expensive, and it's also and high fat. It's high fat. Darius, <laughs> Darius, Darius, don't start eating bacon. It's high fat, but um, but very tasty. But and it's already expensive, and and I mean that really morphs into the inflation discussion we need to have, and we're going to have some special unfiltered shows on inflation in the near future, but um. But, you know, if they, you know, really come on strong on and raise the price of bacon 60 percent, I think it will cause more Californians to leave California than high taxes did. I think people love their bacon. And so uh, we might see a new exodus to Texas because they still allow you to buy bacon in Texas. <laughs> Mike? I'm one of those rare politicians that does not like pork. Um, uh, but... <laughs> But the reality is, look, um, people need protein to survive. Protein is a part of a stable diet. Um, now, pork products typically are lower cost for families. What I'm worried about now is you're going to start raising those prices. And they've been going up, like, like uh, Steve had mentioned, that that access to a low cost protein product that for families, especially families of lower income, is going to be depleted. And here's the other point. A lot of the farmers are frankly pissed at California because we're changing, we're using regulation, although this was from the voters, but God knows how it was marketed. We're using regulation to change the economic dynamic of the situation. It's not naturally happening this way. It's not the consumers demanding this. It's a law in California that's gonna change this whole system and basically price people out of the ability to purchase pork uh, you know, and, or, or protein products, it's terrible. So, I mean, I wonder if it was back, once people feel the pain, if it goes back on the ballot, if they vote for it again. But cramped cages for pigs is not a good thing either. I don't think, okay, that's a, when, you, when you say it that way, it sounds great. But if you really care about pigs, don't eat animal products. I mean, the reality is I eat red meat. I admit that. I like red meat. But I also know that animals are getting killed so I can do that. I mean, I'm not going to lie to myself about that. Good point. Uh, so become vegetarian. Is there a happy, you know, here's the, here's the question, and I and I don't know the answer to this, and I'd love some some of our ag folks in Fresno uh, to weigh in on this. But you know, normally, usually, Darius, there's a happy medium, and the industry is usually the one that can figure it out. And we've seen that time after time with our ag community in Fresno County. They restrict water, the community. The ag industry figures it out. Here, we have politicians trying to figure it out. So there's probably a, a way, Darius, to give the pigs a few more inches, right, in their cage. I, I get that. But, uh, you know, we certainly don't want to sacrifice, you know, um, ag production and commodity produc production here in the Central Valley. Good points. Uh, Mike, last thoughts, because we, uh, we need to wrap up quickly. We have the street racing and a few other yeah. laws. 
To your point, Darius, for example, if they were talking about making sure that farmers feed proper food to the pigs because we consume those, I'd understand that from a USDA safety perspective. I would, that's totally makes sense. But I don't know. I think that when we make decisions, we have to be willing to pay for the consequences. This is, this is about a 60% increase in cost. Good point. Let's see what happens. Okay. Street racing. Uh, AB3, authored by Republican Assemblyman Vince Fogg, Fong of Bakersfield, defines sideshow and allows a driver's license of convicted sideshow participants to be suspended for up to six months. Yeah. We've had a lot of sideshows in Fresno and Clovis yeah. lately, Mike. This is a really welcome uh, piece of legislation. I don't normally say that about things out of Sacramento, but um, you know, you've seen the problems we have in California. Uh, when you lower penalties, when you increase the, you know, you increase the opportunity for criminals or people just to make bad decisions, it's going to happen. In this case, um, yesterday was the one year anniversary of the death of three innocent people in my district. Allison Chang was the 17 year old youngest victim, the only daughter of her mother. She was a senior at Sanger High. I still I, I went to her funeral. I still have those images in my head because she should be here. And she's not here because of street racing. And this is even when the police tried to stop this person. If we had penalties that were serious and that people would know, look, you don't do that kind of a thing in a neighborhood on a street in a neighborhood. Street. You just don't do that. That's not what you do. And, and when we started impounding vehicles, you saw it going down in Northwest Fresno. Then we had to take enforcement away because we only have so many officers and we had the fair and we had the gang operation to deal with the shootings. And then it went up again. So penalties make a difference, at least at a certain minimum level. And it's great. Now we can take away your license for six months. Good. Uh, cocktails to go. But minimum wage goes to 15 bucks January 1st. But we knew that's coming. Cocktails to go got extended a um, few more years. What is it? Restaurants can offer cocktails to go through 2026 under SB 389 which extends the practice that began in an effort to keep restaurants afloat during the pandemic. The law includes provisions to prevent the sale of alcohol to minors. So you own a restaurant, you can sell cocktails to go for about five more years. Oh, but sounds like four more years. About well, five through the end of 26. Um, gender neutral toy sections. Large stores might, must have a gender neutral toy, toy aisle under AB 1084, although enforcement won't begin until 2024. Yeah, that, one, uh, that one seems pretty obtrusive. Um, I'm very much in favor of tolerance and understanding. Um, you, you know, I just, it's one thing to say, okay, as an employer or even the government, everyone system-wide has to offer family medical leave. I get that. But the percentage of the population that has children that are gender neutral is so minimal and, you know, I want to be very careful about this one because it's very easy in this day and age to offend people. I, you know, I, I'm not going to judge someone based on if they have an identity, if they're male, female, or whatever they want to call themselves. That's perfectly okay, in my opinion. It's, it's their, their private business. If you're a parent, it's between you and your child and, and your doctor. Um, but, you know, I just don't understand how we're making companies change how they put things on the shelf. Um, yeah, we already have gender, gender neutral toys already. I mean, that are out there. We just don't classify it as gender neutral. So I don't know. I just, I think this is a little too obtrusive. Yeah. I'm going to go back actually. Cody McDivitt had a comment. Can we please build a raceway in Fresno? It's 30 plus years overdue. I spent 80,000 on my car. It's my hobby, but I got to drive two hours away just to use it. You build dog parks for dogs dog people can we get race tracks for car people mike comments on that or steve anything coming up in fresno county uh I, actually i'd love to i'd love to see here for this so mayor and i really want to do this um we you know we've had talks this is a big big uh this is a potential possibility the question is where um there was talk about doing it in a place that's so we have we have a part of the city that's actually outside city limits in the county it's where our uh, uh um police officer training center is as well as our upcoming fire center but the neighbors out there didn't want it because they don't want that kind of a thing in west fresno it's fine so they don't want it there so where are we going to put it in the city it might come down to partnering with the county it might be just outside of district 2 west 99 but anywhere you go you're going to get nimby that's the problem but this with measure p this could be a major recreational activity this is a huge opportunity to do something like this generate jobs um help 
you know, it, it deal with a problem and also give people a new, new sport to be a part of. There's a culture. There's a good culture to racing. It's not these guys driving on the street, killing people. I and, mean, there are people. Go ahead. And also, you don't have to drive two hours to get to a race. Yep. That's right. And yeah, keep the, those dollars in Fresno and also, you know, less congestion on the highways. We have a big racing community here. Motor racing, motor sports, and then, of course, cars. I mean, motocross, think, don't forget, motor, don't forget motor, motocross. I call it motocross. It okay. would make total sense to do that. We yeah. just got to find a location. Hey, Mike, give me an update because I know you and the mayor and uh, council member Chavez uh, were working on this. Uh, by the way, many people have put their minds to this over the years. Most of the ideas have been rejected because of environmental concerns and CEQA and all the heavy duty regulation associated with racing. So a lot of people have said, hey, I wanted to do that. I think, you know, and so many of us have looked at that in the past, but I thought you guys actually got locked in on a location. Is that changed now or what? We weren't locked in. So the location we were thinking about was still city limits, but outside the city. It was a little, little island we have. But we thought, okay, people are used to the noise from the firing range. So the, you know, having some car noise won't be a problem. There's no homes in the immediate vicinity, but a lot of the community, Mayor and I met with them, a few folks from our black community, they were really upset because they felt like this is just another um, thing that we're putting into West Fresno that will create more pollution. We listened to them, we said, you know, look, if you don't want this here, we're not gonna do that to you. We're not, we'll find another spot to do it. In. And and, and they, they, were, they were not uh, unreasonable about it. So that's what the conclusion we reached. We just gotta find a spot that'll work. Um, but I think once you build it and if you do it right, It'll be great. But you know what? You're, we're going to run into brick walls doing this. I think the problem is we got to just keep pushing and pushing until we find something that works. Just because well, there's strong willpower. You mentioned NIMBYism. Yeah. And, and, you know, just remind, I think everybody knows NIMBY means not in my backyard. And people really, you know, who wants a racetrack in their backyard? When you when you hear that, we all say, no, mm -hmm. I want to go to the racetrack, but I want it to be in somebody else's backyard. But that's just like a lot of things. Um crematoriums, uh, uh, cemeteries, you know, people get weird yeah. ideas. They don't want that apartment complexes. Now, normally you can mitigate through most of those concerns. And so maybe we just haven't begun enough mitigations listening. Okay. What is it that you really are afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of, um, you know, homeless people. Well, okay. Do racetracks draw in homeless people? Well, maybe not. What else? I'm afraid of noise. Well, you know, may, did you know that we're going to put a 15 foot wall around this track that will, you know, that will reduce the noise by 65 percent or whatever. And and we don't allow, you know, it's not going to happen, you know, after 10 p.m. or whatever. So I think I think if we're going to if we're going to get serious about it, we have to get serious about those mitigations. What is the reality uh, in the public? I would like to say and I've said it on unfiltered a couple of times. I visited a good friend of mine in Boise, Idaho, uh, three years ago, the year before COVID. They have a racetrack like you're proposing, Mike. They have a racetrack in a downtown area. Well, no, it's not downtown like Fresno knows downtown. I should say they have a racetrack in the middle of town. It'd be the equivalent of putting a racetrack like um, on Blackstone or Fresno Street and Gettysburg. And um, let me tell you, it's fantastic. There's stands, there's food, people go have fun. It takes some of the crazy racers off the street. They, they find a, a positive place to spin their wheels and they can go join a club and they can modify their cars and they can race, they can race one another, or race different uh, divisions. And it's very, very fascinating. I've watched um, my buddy was in a format where you race trucks and, um, and there were, you know, you know, to probably 40 trucks that were in this division. It was very fun, fascinating to watch. I watched three races. I had some great tacos and it was a lot of fun. And it was not way out of town. It was right kind of in the middle. And so and it, it was, can be done, but there's a difference between Idaho and California and a lot of that regulation, you know, and air quality and some of those concerns. And I get it, but uh, I think it's going to come down to willpower. Is the mayor, is this really something he wants to get done? along with several council members, such as yourself, uh, it, does the county get involved? It's, a, it's gonna be a matter of willpower. Right, yep. And the best part is you enjoyed that and you weren't even racing. 
this is a community activity. Um, so I, I think that's great. I wish we could do something like that here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm still very hopeful. It's still early enough. I'm still very hopeful. Okay. If there is nothing else on the agenda for you gents, uh, should we wrap up the last show of 2021? Yeah, Darius, I wanted to, I know we're going to have some special shows. I want uh, unfiltered um, audience to be on the lookout for some shows on inflation. But, in, you know, we just talked with um, Donato, uh, who teaches math at Sanger High. And um, <clears throat> I've been looking at the effects of inflation on, on, uh, on an investment strategy. Uh, by the way, one of the, uh, oh, Donato, you're still with us. Fantastic. One of the one thing I learned, don't leave your money in the bank because inflation will chew that money up. And I was going to segue into the $15 an hour minimum wage. That dollar is already gone. That dollar that's just going to, that extra dollar per hour that's going to be introduced in January 1st is already gone because of inflation. And so I think people uh, need to understand the damaging effects of inflation. Their money becomes less valuable and doesn't go as far. And so we're gonna have some special shows on that. That's a really good point, Steve. Uh, we've talked about it on this show before. In, uh, inflation is really a big tax on the middle class that uh, so much of America is uh, going through and suffering through and will continue, unfortunately, for probably the first quarter, maybe the first half of next year. Uh, I'm hopeful that it will, get tamed down to around two or two and a half percent by the fourth quarter. But our industry, the uh, construction industry, inflation is just incredible. It's very volatile. Don't know what product is gonna cost you next week even. Um, so yeah, stay tuned folks. Steve makes a really great point. Stay tuned uh, from food prices to gas, to construction, to uh, used cars uh and car parts etc we're going to be talking um, several times about that early next year and it's gonna it's gonna hit us in politics too because i heard today that the nationwide price of gasoline is projected to be four dollars a gallon by about memorial day now they say there will be some regions it will still be in the three dollar range but you know here in california it's already been way over four but if, if it starts moving towards four nationwide, uh, you know, you're going to see the Biden administration pay the price for that, in, the, in my opinion. Especially with November elections coming uh, in about in less than a year. Mike. I think this is going to be a big factor in the midterms. And the question is, look, there's lots of reasons why inflation happens, why production costs go up. But we're going to be able to say you know, the question is, who are they going to be able to blame for decisions being made? Lumber, for example, lumber being out of control. Well, you know, both administrations decided to give money to help stimulate the economy. And then people just didn't want to go back to work. And the pandemic changed people's psychological profile. They wanted to have a different quality of life. But we need people to run those lumber mills. And now we're still have, we still have tariffs with Canadian lumber. Well, and, we need to, and, and Biden administration doubled Canadian lumber tariffs just a few weeks ago. Yeah, we might need to just take those off temporarily and so we can yeah. stabilize yeah. our prices and kind of give an incentive people to go back to work. I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable yeah. because middle-class yeah. taxes, right? Developers don't pay for the extra cost in lumber. It gets passed on to the consumer. That's just the way it works. A, a price of a home for a resident in my district or a recent college graduate, they're getting married. I, my council assistant just got married. They want to buy a home. Um, they used to have this sign in a, in a development, the high 200s. Now it's the low threes and it's going up. It's mid threes now because the everything's out of control and it's very difficult to price things out. Right. That's just the reality. It hurts okay. Main Street. So there's still plenty of time. I think they can make a difference, but they're going to have to stop these, for example, lumber tariffs. Just knock it out for three months and see what happens. But we'll Good point. Okay. Uh, Steve, any final comments? Wrap up comments from Steve? Oh, this is, if this is our final comments, the last time we had uh, Unfiltered, I wished everybody a Merry Christmas. So um, my final comment is happy new year. We're coming in roaring into 2022. Um, it should be a great year. Everybody should uh, plan on making it a personal great year. So uh, um, happy new year from me to you, or as our president would say, happy 4th of July. 
<laughs> I... I... <laughs> okay, uh, Mike, and then Donato, and then I'll wrap up. Yeah, I, I think, um, joking aside, I think 2022 is going to be a great year. It can only get better. Um, a lot of us had events for, you know, with family for Christmas, and I know there are folks out there that probably ended up talking politics and gotten big arguments, but here's what I'm going to tell you. You know, chances are most of us will never meet Donald Trump or Joe Biden. There's really no point in breaking up our families because we disagree on 3% of politics, when in reality, we have shared values and we're family. Um, it's it's not worth it. Keep your family together. Those, those, those values are what's important. So um, if you had a big fight, it's never too late to fix that and try to, you know, move on. And uh, that's a good way to start uh, the new year, you know, building those bonds and focusing on what really matters. So thank you. And thank you so much to our crew here at GV Wire doing a great job. Um, you know, uh, Alana's home. She's not feeling well, but uh, you've been doing a great job. And, you know, and Albert and Johnny, you just everyone and, and Jaws, everyone's in a great job. Thank you. So, and Darius, thank you for hosting. No, thank you, Mike. Donato, uh, you have one minute for wrap up comments and then we're going to get off the air. Uh, again, Darius, uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, Mike's been a pleasure. Steve, thank you as well. Um, yeah, just looking forward to 2022, um, trying to be, you know, the best teacher I can mm -hmm. be. I might not get every student in my class with straight A's, but I do my best to keep those students in the seats. And, you know, just them being in school is, you know, a win for me sometimes. So thank you. I want to wish you and your families a happy new year. And, uh, you know, if it's if it's in the cards and there's enough room, uh, Mike, um, also try to throw a motocross track in that uh, in those plans yeah. as well for me. You know, I can get my dirt bike out of the garage, you know, teachers have three weeks off in the winter. So <laughs> I'd love to get some riding in. But thank you, guys. We can do a, a club for the kids to come out and learn that. So that, that, that'd be great. Let's yes. do it. I've been working on it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. And on behalf of all of us at GB Wire, uh, uh, happy new year to all of you. Be safe out there. There's going to be lots of cops checking for DUIs. Uh, so please uh, be safe. Don't drink and drive. Uh, I'm grateful uh, for all of our viewers and the team, Steve and Mike. Uh, and all of our panelists over the last 12 months and looking forward to a great 2022. Uh, hopefully some good news, uh, economy doing well, not too overregulated and uh, not too overheated. We'll, hopefully uh, inflation will start getting curbed by the second half of the year. But looking forward to seeing all of you next year. Happy New Year from our home to yours. <laughs>